then speak to one of the elders or myself, pass on your emails. And for some reason, uh, you should be getting every Saturday morning what we call the staying in touch, which is the email, keeps us all up to date what's happening in the congregation. So if you're not on that list, see myself or one of the elders. Uh, Richard's an elder. Uh, where are the other elders? There's another elder. And there's Ben with the beard. Uh, speak to him. So, and, oh, where's Matt? Oh, there he is. I won't say anything about your facial features at all, um, except to say you're a teacher. Yes, lots of love. Um, so please make sure you keep up with those because it's hard in a, a church this size to keep everyone informed uh, if you're not involved in that. Uh, the other thing I want to say is on behalf of the camp committee, can I just encourage you, thank you for those who responded really promptly. Um, <clears throat> we have pretty much... Uh, the vast majority of the church now responded positively. The camp will be going forward. We're looking forward to that. Uh, just a thanks for the camp committee because they did a ton of work on this leading up to it. So thank you for that. And hopefully you've been reading your staying in touch and then you'll know that we've had a change of leadership uh, for the uh, play group, which is commencing soon. And uh, Mrs. Duncanson was leading it. We thank you. You're stepping down or stepping back for a little while. Uh, <clears throat> Because you never say never, so just stepping back is probably the best way to say it. So thank you for your service. But also, um, our ladies were over here in the left. I saw them at one point. Where's Ailes is over there? And where's Mrs. Grave, Tash? Oh, she is over there. She's hiding. Okay, so they're leading it now. So if you're interested in the play group or you know a mum in the community would like to come to the play group, see both um, Tash and Ailes and they'll help you with that. Well, let me call you to worship. Um, in Job, you know the book of Job, Job's life basically unravels before him in rapid time. Uh, he deals initially with it really, really well. But then with the encouragement of both his suffering and his wife and his friends, he starts to wonder, why is God doing this to me? Why is this all happening? And so the whole book is just basically this unpacking of theodicy, which means this difficulty of dealing with um, evil in the world. And then when you get to chapter 38, you start to get God's answer to it. Um, and, and my son showed me a meme this morning <laughs> about the universe, which we can put God, someone asking, you know, basically what's going on, you know, I don't understand. And, and the response is, well, you won't, you don't get it. And that's what Job is saying. Uh, it's hard for us to understand these things because we're human. This is what he says in uh, Job 38. He says, dress for action like a man. I will question you. That is, God will now question Job. And you will make it known to me, your answers. And he says in uh, Job 38, 4, were, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have any, any understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling hand and prescribed limits for it and set bars and doors, and said, Thus far shall you come, and no farther. And here shall your proud waves be stayed. Have you commanded the morning since the days began? And of course, Joseph is to say, oh, not me. No, I don't understand. And there's a sense in which God has revealed himself to us in creation and through his word and son, but we don't know all things. And there is mystery about him in this universe and that's why we worship him. So let's, let's do that this morning. Our Heavenly Father, as we come before you, we, we see our smallness. We live in a culture that, that, that promotes our bigness as if somehow that we're in control of all things, even the climate, uh, even nations. And yet what is so evident is we can't even control ourselves. We can't even control harsh words or hatred. We can't control enmity between a neighbour and the next neighbour or a nation 
and another nation. And so we humble ourselves before you. There are some things we do not comprehend, but this is what we do. That you are our God. You are the creator of all things, seen and unseen. You sustain all things, that all power is in your hand and everything is unfolding according to your divine purposes, even though to us they are incomprehensible. What we know about you is that you are good and that the Lord of the earth will do what is good. And so as we gather this morning to worship you, I'll be gracious to us. If we're in a place of joy, then help us to number our blessings. If we're feeling refreshed and encouraged and thankful, then fill our hearts with joy as we give thanks to you for your goodness and provisions. If our life is hard and filled with difficult things, then help us to seek you, even if we feel like we're surrounded in darkness, that your divine light might shine upon us. And most of all, we pray this morning, forgive our sins. Forgive where we have not controlled our tongue or our hands or our mind. And we would plead Christ and his blood that it would cleanse us. And to that extent, receive us in our worship so that all we, that we do this morning, that it would bring honour and glory to Jesus Christ and it would build up your church. For we ask it all in his precious name. Amen. Well, let's stand. We're going to sing our first song of praise, Only a Holy God.
Quad Kids come up for catechism? Need more chairs soon, I think. My name's Scott. Good morning, children. Welcome to welcome to church this morning. So this morning we're going to answer a question: What is the significance of baptism as a seal of the covenant? And so, one of the ways that we can think about that is with gold stars. Who can tell me what these are for? Where might you get a gold star? Oliver? At school, when you, when you do something good, when you get something right. Would you like to be one of my volunteers? If you could come up. Isla, would you like to be a volunteer as well? You want to come up the front? So we get a gold star when we get something right. So... Maybe we can ask Oliver some questions and we'll see if he gets those right. So maybe we'll ask Isla some questions as well. Let's start with Isla. Isla, can you tell me the first six digits of pi? (laughs) Not sure? That's okay. All right. Oliver, who made you? Oh, well done, Isla. You're right. The gold star. All right, let's try again, Isla. How many usable addresses are there in a slash 24 network? (laughs) Not sure? Okay, that's an IT question. Oliver, what else did God make? You and all things? Well done, Isla. It's right again. Good job. (laughs) Keep stacking those up. All right, Isla. What is the area of a rectangle whose length is one furlong and whose width is one chain? I'm not sure. Okay. Why did God make you and all things, Oliver? For his own glory. That's right. Well done, Isla. <laughs> how, many, how many stickers do you have? Should be three there. Three. How many questions did you get right? <laughs> because... Oliver got the questions right for you. So because of what Oliver did, you get to be right. You get to have the gold stars. And so that might be nice if what we think is really important is gold stars. But here at church, what we think is really important is our relationship with God. And so it's an even more wonderful thing that because of what Christ did on the cross, we have righteousness for those that believe in him We have righteousness in the eyes of God. And so baptism is one of the the signs that we use to show that. And so the answer to the question is baptism is a seal of the righteousness that is had by faith. So it's a beautiful and wonderful thing that because we believe in Jesus, we have that righteousness before God. And so we can have a relationship with him. So, thanks, guys. You can sit down now. (laughs) All right. Let's pray to God, and then we'll do our kids' song. So, hands in front, eyes closed, heads down. Let's pray to God. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you would love us in such a way that you would send your Son, that your Son would become sin, that we might become righteous before you in your eyes, not through anything that we do or anything that we deserve, but because of his perfect life and his willingness to do your will and uh, die upon a cross and then be raised again, that we're in turn made righteous and we can spend forever with you, um, in communion with you. So um, I ask God that you would... uh, do that work in all of these children, that they might have faith in Jesus, that they might come to know him and love him and repent of their sin 
that they might have that righteousness and have that assurance that they can spend eternity in your presence. So I pray that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Now our kids' song will be Little by Little. So let's enjoy that. PC. I uh, just felt I should answer some of Scott's questions there. Um, the network subnet 24 has 256 network addresses in it. There are 255 of them usable. If, okay, if you use 1.1 1 .1 as your uh, router, then yes, 254 usable. As to the re rectangle area, I believe it changes depending on the city, so I can't really give you an answer for that. <laughs> All right, we are, uh, we are turning to Hebrews chapter 11 today for our first reading. And we're going to start at verse 1 and go through to verse 6 in the middle of a section, which Darren assures me is the correct en ending spot for today's reading. Uh, for those of you with the ESV study Bibles, You'll find that around page 1793, starting at verse 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which, he was commend through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. This is the word of the Lord. I don't even know what happened before then. Um, that's probably the first time you've ever heard tongues in a Presbyterian church. <laughs> Hopefully we'll never hear it again. Um, I thought we had a security thing on there, no nerds inside. <laughs> anyway, um, thank you for at least speaking English when you read from Hebrews. Hebrews is a great reminder that... Um, He's talking about faith. He'll go on in chapter 12 to talk about the hall of faith in a sense. But he's reminding us that you cannot please God without it. 
You cannot please God unless you trust in him and seek him. And he is the rewarder of those who seek him. And our text is sort of about that in Luke. We've been working our way through Luke's gospel. He's had the Sermon on the Mount. And then we, he's just finished his sermon. And our text, verses 1 to 10 of Luke chapter 7, is about, uh, as the crowd's about to disperse, uh, some leaders, Jewish leaders and elders, come and speak to Jesus about a healing. So let's pick up the text. We're reading from uh, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7. We're going to read verses 1 through to 10. And this is God's word. After he had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Now a centurion had a servant who was sick and at the point of death who was highly valued by him. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent, him, he sent to him elders of the Jews asking him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly saying, He is worthy to have you do this for him, for he loves our nation and for he is the one who built us our synagogue. And Jesus went with them. When he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore I did not presume to come to you, but say the word and let my servant be healed. For I too am a man set under authority with soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turning to the crowd that followed him said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant well. Amen. May the Lord give us understanding of his word. Let's, let's pray. Father, as we are come now to hear your word, we pray that uh, you would give to us minds, uh, which are sharp, uh, minds which are receptive, hearts which are humble, so that your word might do its work of transforming us. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear, so that we might only those who hear the word of God, but heed it. For we ask all these things for the glory of Jesus and for the building up of the church. Amen. Well, as you know, so, some, some people are are uh, easily amused. Uh, you know when you're visiting your forgetful, forgetful is a kind way of saying slightly, uh, you know, dementia, but, but, but forgetful grandma, and you tell her she's 93, and she's shocked because she just thought she was 43. Or, or you know when you've got an exhausted parent, and, and, and you say, you know, you've had a terrible day, and... You say to your child, your teenager, your young child, and you say to them, do this, and then they do it. <laughs> and you, you're amazed. First time obedience. Or, you know, when you've got little children and you're doing magic tricks and getting things to appear and disappear, and they're very easily am amazed. And we all know situations like that. And, of course, there are other situations where people are not so easily amazed. But let's say you had a wife with, I don't know, say five new dresses, four new storage boxes, two new pairs of shoes, one relatively new home, and let's say an exceptional husband. And the sort of husband, the sort of husband that sets a very high bar when it comes to anniversary celebrations. You know, sort of short trips to warm climates, uh, you know, all those minimum four-star hotels with killer swimming pools. So you can imagine how amazed she might be if you arrive for your short holiday at the 2.5 star uh, Carayo Motel, because it would probably be a shorter holiday than you would imagine. The reality is, she's in good company, because Jesus is not so easily amazed. He's not amazed by the wavering loyalty of his family and his friends. Not when his family come to literally collect him, saying that he's lost the plot and he needs to come home. Not when his disciples say, we'll never leave you, but well, you know, we sort of did. Not even when he gets betrayed by a kiss and then arrested. 
He's not amazed by huge crowds that follow him. He's not amazed by those who want to make him king, nor by those who would have him dead. He's not easily amazed. Not easily shocked and stopped in his track. But I tell you, there's one thing that does amaze him, and that's faith. In chapter 4, he marveled at the lack of faith in his hometown. He marveled that you could have so little faith. And in chapter 7, he marvels at the strength of faith of a Roman soldier. So I want, to, I want us to look at the text. But as we're looking at the text, I want you to be thinking about your own faith. Think, and I want you to think about what, what strong faith might look like. Whether Jesus would marvel at your faith, hopefully because of a, not a lack of it, but because of the strength of it. And then how you might respond to God's word today. So look at verses 1 and 2 of chapter 7. That, that gives us that context. After he'd finished all his sayings, that is, after he'd finished the sermon, he'd landed the plane in the hearing of the people, he then entered Capernaum. Now, a centurion had a servant who was sick and at the point of death, who was valued, highly valued by him. And so he's, he's finished his sermon and he's heading into Capernaum. And remember, in chapter 4, his hometown rejected him and they tried to kill him, but you try to throw him off a cliff. And so Matthew 9, 1 tells us that Capernaum became his hometown, his home city. And so Jesus is now relocated from Nazareth to Capernaum. And surprisingly, five of his disciples were all fishermen at Capernaum. It's a medium-sized city, uh, mainly, obviously, agrarian culture. It's farmers, it's fishers, it's merchants. But it's also located on a trade route between Damascus and Egypt. That's why knowledge of Jesus spreads so fast and so quickly because he's doing so many miracles at Capernaum on a trade route. And so people are hearing and seeing and they're telling others about it as they travel with all of their merchandise. And so he's entering his hometown and we're told that, that there's a certain centurion who had a servant. And the servant, we're told, strangely, is highly valued. A servant he holds in high regard. And we're also told in the text that this servant is dying. In fact, it says, on the point of death. The Greek says, literally, it says, he had it bad. <laughs> Whatever it was that he had, he had it bad. He's on the point of death. And so that tells us the context. And then in verses 3 to 5, you start to see something about the centurion, about his, his need and about his boldness. In verse 3 and following, we read, When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent to him elders of the Jews, asking him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, He is worthy to have you do this for him, for he loves our nation. And he is the one who built our synagogue. This bloke has clout. He, he, he's a Gentile. He's a Roman soldier. So remember, these are Jews. He's, he's part of the oppressors. And yet somehow he, he's obviously some sort of God-fearer. He's obviously got some power and wealth and influence. Enough so that he could send the Jewish elders to meet Jesus. And, and they tell him about his dying servant in the hope that, that, that Jesus would come and heal him. That in itself is unusual. I mean, servants are cheap. You're living in a culture where life is cheap, people die. Most children don't make it out of infancy. Rome, probably filled with 40, 50, maybe even 60%, some say, of all the people who were there were slaves or servants. 
And if that one died, guess what? Top down the market. You didn't even have to worry about eBay. They were just everywhere. You just replaced your slave. And you've got this Roman soldier. He's a pagan. He's not even a Jew. And he highly regards his slave, his servant. That in itself is strange in the text. It says something about this century. He also sort of reminds us of that character in the Old Testament, Naaman. You know, both are Gentiles, both are military leavers, both have connection to Jews, both seek a, seek a healing from a prophet which they've never personally met. And yet in both cases, there's a healing. And so here is this servant, uh, these Jewish leaders, and they're, they're coming to Jesus and they're pleading with him earnestly. You know, like a, a teenage boy does when he begs for a motorbike or you know, a little girl pleading for a Disney party. They do it earnestly. There is an earnestness about it. This is, this is sort of not like um, you know, a conversation with sport with Daniel Contridge of which he has little knowledge and even less interest. There is an, this is Greta Thunberg at a climate conference earnestness. And they plead his case. Yes, he's a Gentile, they say. Yes, he's a Roman. But Lord, he loves our people. He loves our nation. You know what? He even built our synagogue. If there's ever a Gentile bloke, a Roman oppressor who deserves our help, they're saying, this is the bloke. This one here. And then look at verses 6 to 8. You see his humility and confidence. And Jesus went with them. When he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you. But say the word, let my servant be healed. For I too am man set under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. So the elders, they, they, they convince Jesus to come with them. And no longer has Jesus rounded the corner of the street where this bloke lives, and they're not far from the house. And remember, the huge mob is in tow. Some Italian blokes appear with a message from their boss. See what I did there? Mob, boss, Italians. Yeah, that way. I thought it was clever when I was putting it together, but anyway, clearly not. And so, so as these blokes arrive, they come to him to say, listen, don't, don't trouble yourself. Literally, again, in the Greek, it's saying, don't flay the skin. Don't, don't let it cost you anything. You don't need to, to go out of your way any further. It, it's, it's, it's slang. For, for don't cause yourself any trouble or grief. And, 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 it, and it's indicative that here is this Roman centurion, and he doesn't want to bother God. <laughs> but he loves his servant. He loves this bloke, this servant. For whatever reason, and he's willing to humble himself, even though he knows he's unworthy to trouble Jesus, and he, he sends the Jews to do it. And he sends friends say, Look, you don't have to come any further. You've come enough. I'll put you into enough trouble. I know who you are. Just say the word. That'll do. That'll be sufficient. He knows he doesn't come to Jesus himself, not out of pride, but out of humility. He's saying, I know I'm a Gentile. I know who I am. I know I'm a Roman soldier oppressing your people. But I also understand that you're holy and powerful. And you could just say the word. And let my servant be healed. I'm to a man under authority. He says, I understand it. I say, go, they go. I say, come, they come. I say, do it. They do it. I know how authority and power works. I know who you are. So you just have to say the word and it will come to pass. That's what confidence in Christ looks like. The question is not, can he do it? The question is, will he do it? Will it honor him? Will it further his kingdom? It is, is it his will for you? Can he remove your suffering? Of course he can take away your suffering. 
Can he give you children? He can give you tons of children. Can he give you a new job? He can give you a new job. Can he fix you? No, I can't fix your face. But you know what I mean? He can do anything. The, the question isn't, Lord, can you do this? The question is, Lord, is it your will to do this? Because so often the things that we think are good and the things that we want would actually be a ruin and disaster. And so in his kindness and his wisdom, he often withholds things from us. But this man, he understands this Roman centurion. He gets it. I now have power work. So you just say the word. You don't have to come. You don't have to see. You don't have to touch him. Just say it. It's done. I get it. And look at how Jesus responds in verses 9 to 10. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turning to the crowd that followed him said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant well. In other words, the text is telling us here is God walking earth and he's literally stopped in his tracks. And he's astonished, he's amazed. And the text says he marveled. And so he turns to the crowd and he says, I tell you, truly, truly, I tell you, behold, not even in Israel, not amongst my own people, not amongst the Jews, not amongst those who have known about Yahweh for thousands of years, who claim Abraham and Isaac and Jacob as their fathers, who have the Old Testament scriptures in their possession, who have worshipped in the temple and have had all the prophets, not even amongst those have I seen such faith. The bloke gets it. And Jesus is astonished. He's astonished at both the quality and the clarity of the faith. Surpasses anything he's seen in Israel, including his own disciples. And he finds this faith among the Gentiles, among Israel's oppressors. And he just marveled. So what should we make of the text? Well, well, let me just say the obvious thing that may not be so obvious. Jesus is modelling his sermon. You, you can't miss that. The whole sermon has been banging on about the golden rule, about how you love those who are your neighbours, your enemies. That is, you. the golden rule is that you treat others how you yourself want to be treated. He's modelling it right before us. It's easy to be lost in the text, but love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Luke chapter 6, verse 27. He preached that, turned on his heels, finished his sermon, walked towards Capernaum, and then saw one of his enemies or heard of one of his enemies, a Roman oppressor, and then he does him good and he loves him and he meets him in his need. I've no doubt uh, throughout Israel, remember the Romans of the oppressions, if they were allowed, there would have been invasion day marches every year commemorating uh, or commiserating from 63 BC when the Romans annexed Israel. And so what Jesus is doing is he's modelling the golden rule in the text. And surprisingly, so is the centurion. The centurion's there. He's modelling the golden rule. He cares and has concern for others, even his servant. Even his servant. What, does the gospel even go to your servants, the equivalent of your dog in Roman thinking? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. And so here is this centurion, and he's modelling the faith. And they're both there meant to get us to reflect on the golden rule that Jesus has just been preaching about. This bloke doesn't just love his servant. He's shown generosity to the Jews, even though he, he, he knows that the Romans are hated, even though he knows that almost everyone around him who were Jewish saw him as unclean, unloved, probably unredeemable. And yet, He's gracious to that people and he loves that nation and he's kind to his servants. And Luke is offering up this Roman soldier as an example, a surprising one. 
But he, he's an example or a picture of the bloke who has dug deep and built his house on the solid foundations of Jesus' words. He hears and then he heeds. He's, he's not just a, a hearer, but he's a doer. And all of that flows from his faith. His faith is ultimately what Jesus marveled at. His faith is what stopped Jesus in his tracks. His faith is what pleased Jesus on the streets of Capernaum. Because as Brandon read to us from Hebrews 11, 6, without faith, without faith, if you don't have faith, if you don't believe God, it is impossible to please him. There's no other way of doing it. There is no other way it can happen. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So you're not only saved by faith, that is that you believed God's promises that, that Christ died for your transgressions, for your lies and pride and deceit and immorality and greed and indifference and, and you can think of all your other transgressions. Not only are you saved by faith, but Jesus is telling us in this sermon and we're seeing it in the centurion, you're supposed to walk by faith or live by faith. Can you remember in Matthew 6.30 when Jesus rebukes people of little faith? Of little faith. Remember when he says, um, he says that they know that God provides for the flowers. And the, Remember when he says that in his sermon? He says, oh, look at the flowers of the field and the lilies and see how God clothes them and the birds of the air who don't store, etc., etc." And he's saying, as you observe all those things and understand that God is sovereign and he cares for all of his creation, and then he rebukes them for saying, you are of little faith because you know these truths, but you fail to apply it to your own lives. And he says, that's why you're anxious. That, that's why you fall into despair. That's why you function at times as if there is no God. Because although you know God is sovereign, you actually live as if he's not. And Jesus says that they were supposed to reason that if God looks after the lesser, that is the lilies of the field and the birds of the air, how much more would he look after the greater, that is you, who he created and loves? A Ruth will tell you that when we wrestled with having more than five kids, we got to five and we put the handbrake on. I was just actually put the handbrake and took it out of gear and we weren't moving any further in five. But anyway, uh, as providence unfolded and my wife conspired, we eventually got to the point where we decided that we would have more children. But you know, one of the reasons we went, we were trying to be reasonable, we were trying to say, can we afford to have more children? We've got five kids. We can barely afford five. And we, we read that text from Matthew, Matthew 6. And it encourages because we reasoned, as Jesus said, we ought to. We reasoned if God can provide for the lilies of the field, how much more for his servants and their families? And whether we have five kids or seven kids. That's why Lily, our sixth born, got her name. She's supposed to remind us all the time, Lily, that God provides That's what Jesus is saying here. Now, I don't know if this centurion downloaded the Sermon on the Mount. I really can't say if Jesus' words about the lilies of the fields, if he heard and heeded them. But this is what I can say. The centurion reasoned that if Jesus is God, just to say the word, and the word will be enough. For him, the theological penny had dropped. Has it dropped for you? Have you reasoned that? Have you got that? Has your faith grasped that simple but profound truth? You are sitting here today, most of you largely professing to be followers of Jesus Christ. You believe the good news. And it is great news. 
God has redeemed the people to himself. God forgives our sins. God has died on a cross, as we were showing in our kids' talk, and because of Jesus' right answers and right actions and right words and right life, we get all the stars. As if we answered right. And we, we believe the gospel. We, we say that we believe in the one who created all things, indeed sustains all things. You know, the one who flung stars into the skies, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hands, who has said there to the rivers and the, to, to, the, to the seas, there you shall come and come no further. Who's commanded the sun on its course and directs the lightning into its path. You believe as followers of Jesus Christ that God is sovereign, powerful and benevolent. That is, he's kind. He's kind. The one who made all the nations, or Paul says, quotes from a secular source in Acts 17 at the Areopagus, the one in whom we live and move and have all our being. We believe in that one. The one who controls the nations and determines their influence and powers and the boundaries and their dwelling places. Or as the Proverbs teach us, for even a king's heart is like a, a stream of water in the hand of the Lord and he turns it wherever he will. That's the sovereign king. And it seems to me that if you believe those things, then surely your faith ought to reason that you can trust God in the hard things in life, with all your, your fears about your life or loneliness or happiness and marriage or mortgage and health, with the hard thing. You might be here this morning and your marriage is literally on a precipice, a relationship hanging by a thread. And you think to yourself, I can't do this anymore. You're right, you can't do it. But your face is supposed to say, but I know someone who can give me strength to do it. And you've got to start acting and, and responding in that faith and say, Lord, I am weak. Make me strong. Lord, my marriage is falling apart, so make me the glue that keeps it together. Your faith ought to reason that you can trust God with all the precious things in your life. You know, all your dreams and your, your hopes about your work and your home and your plans for retirement and old age and your finances, your kids and the grandkids, the things that are important to you, surely your faith ought to reason that God is good and benevolent and powerful. I can actually trust him with these things and bring them before him. And if that's so, then you can also do the things in your life which are hard to believe. You know what those are, those, those situations where things just literally there doesn't seem any way forward. And you're in a season of lack or pain or testing or loneliness or darkness and uncertainty. And then Jesus says, cast your eyes over the field and you see the lilies. And how your benevolent father cares for those who can't store food. How much more does he care for you? And this Roman soldier got it. And the penny dropped and he said to him, just say the word, that'll do. Because as Romans 10, 17 tells us, faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of God. I want to close with this, but you know what? If you want to grow a faith that amazes Jesus, if you want to have a strong and robust faith, can I just... You've got to dig deep. Isn't that what the sermon was about? Isn't that the sermon that Jesus just finished? He says, the man whose house that stands is the man or the woman who digs deep foundations and finds a solid rock. That is Jesus and his word. If you want a life and a marriage and, 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 and a family that is robust and you want a strong faith, then you better start digging deep. 
Because as you dig deep, you realize you have a big God who's benevolent and who loves you and encourages you to come to him and to seek him for he is the rewarder of those who seek him in faith. And then maybe, just maybe, our faith might cause him to marvel. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we thank you for your word, which is truth. It's like a mirror that as we look into it, we see ourselves in all our failings and weakness, but we also see you in all your glory and power and grace and benevolence and your kindness to us, cajoling and encouraging each and every one of us, from the youngest to the oldest, to reason in our faith that if we truly believe that Jesus is the Lord, the King, the one who loves us and redeemed us, then he's the one who will provide for us. And his word is enough. If it's yes, no, not yet, it's enough. His strength, sufficient. His wisdom, all-encompassing. And so we thank you, our Heavenly Father, for your word this morning. Strengthen our faith. So our lives might be adorned with good fruit that pleases you and causes you to marvel. For we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you've uh, prepared your heart, we're going to sing as our song of response, Come, Praise and Glorify. Uh, and the idea here is that God has spoken to us and now we respond um, and we want to respond in praise. And if you're a believer this morning, you can sing this song and you can belt it out. Uh, if you're not a Christian this morning and you've been hearing God's word and you're not where the centurion is yet, the faith hasn't dropped, you haven't quite come to that point where you put your trust in Jesus, then I want to encourage you to consider Christ today and maybe then you'll be able to also sing these words with conviction. Let's stand and we'll sing together our song of response, Come, Praise and Glorify. God who saves. 
to a time of corporate prayer. Uh, we will pray together, pray for the work of the kingdom and pray for God's people. Um, just a couple of things that we've been praying for recently. We'll remember Matt and Kate Vinicombe. Uh, they're missionaries. They were in a bad car accident uh, probably a month ago, three, four weeks ago. Uh, Kate's still in a pretty bad way. Um, I think Matt's doing better, but we'll keep them in prayer. And John Wilson... Uh, John and his wife, they lost their daughter after a long, their adult daughter after a long illness. So we'll keep them in prayer as well. Uh, let's pray together. Pray with me. Dear Lord, uh, we thank you that we can come to you in prayer. Lord, we uh, acknowledge that we're a, a sinful and uh, broken people and we're unworthy to come into your presence. Um, we thank you that because of Christ that we can come to you and his uh, work on our behalf, his life and death and resurrection and the fact that he intercedes for us. Uh, we, we thank you for that and the privilege to come to you as your children. Um, we praise you, Lord, uh, for your majesty. We praise you for your glory. We uh, see your majesty and glory revealed in the world around us in your creation we see it in your word we see it in your son uh, and the work that he's done lord uh, we see it in your people that you've saved from sin um, we see it in the love that you constantly pour out on us um, we thank you for that and because of that love that you have for us lord we uh, we come to you as your children and we uh, can pray to you and we we have things that we would ask of you uh, we think we pray for your people here at North Geelong uh, we there are many needs uh, there are many who are downcast or um, lonely or isolated or or sick Lord we pray for your grace on them on us that you would heal, that you would uh, convict where repentance is needed. Lord, we pray that you would uh, care for your people here, that you would uh, build them up uh, in the likeness of your son and become more like our king. Uh, we pray for uh, our city, our city of Shalom. Uh, Lord, we pray for all your people here it's a big city with uh, a lot of a lot of saints in it lord there's a lot that are um a lot of people that don't know you we pray that your word will go out and that hearts would be softened and would turn in repentance and faith uh, we pray for your people here that they would be faithful in their witness we uh, pray for our uh, brothers and sisters in other churches around geelong uh, particularly for the ones in our presbytery, Lord, for uh, Luke at Geelong West and uh, Matt at Bano and Surendra at the Lee, and uh, particularly for uh, Brett at the Ballerine, Lord. We pray that you would be with those men as they minister and teach. Uh, we pray for their elders there as well as they shepherd your people, that they would build your people up for um, service in your kingdom and that your saints would be salt and light in this uh, town, this area, and that you would bring many to faith as a, uh, on the back of the work that your people are doing. Lord, we um, pray for the work uh, going into the Lara plant, Lord. Um, we plan and we, we uh, strategize and we um, think about how to best approach this work, Lord. We know that all our plans are nothing if you don't bring them to fruition, that uh, 
we can't actually do this in our own strength and we rely on you. We know that if you will, that you uh, will speak a word and, and it will be fruitful and profitable. We pray that you would do that. Help us to um, be faithful in that planning or that, uh, that endeavour that we would have boldness from faith in serving you and that we would be uh, courageous as we go about that endeavour too. Not frightened, uh, but we would do it with joy. Uh, we pray for uh, our brothers and sisters um, yeah, further afield. We think of John Wilson and his wife um, and the recent loss of their daughter. Uh, we pray that you would be with them. We know that she... Um, had faith and that she is one of your children. She is now at peace with you. Uh, we thank you for that. Um, we pray that you would comfort uh, her family who are still left here. Uh, yeah, we pray that you would draw near to them, that they would know your love and be comforted at a, at a very difficult time. Uh, we pray also for... Um, we pray for Matt and Kate Vinicombe. Uh, we, again, we've, we've heard this morning and we know that if you, if it's your will that you can speak a word and you can heal Kate, uh, we pray that you would do that. We don't know your plans, but we pray that you would uh, be kind to her. Uh, we pray that you would be near to the family, uh, that they would, um, be strengthened in their faith and not, not, uh, despairing but they would have confidence that you are good, even though we don't know your plans all the time. Uh, Lord, we pray also for our, um, our people as we go back into school term, uh, as, we, as things start up again for the year. Lord, we pray for uh, all the... Um, the groups that are starting back in the next couple of weeks for Bible studies and uh, play group. We pray especially for play group for Elsa and Tash that they would uh, take this and run with it and be um, strengthened and encouraged. Give them the strength that they need and pray that you would bless that ministry. We pray for uh, kids going back to school and uh, mums at school pickups and, and um all the things that start up again, we pray that you would help us to be faithful witnesses, not uh, clouded by the busyness of the year, but to be focused and faithful and salt and light in our communities as we go back out. Uh, Lord, we pray further for our state and our country. You tell us to uh, pray for our leaders, so we'll do that. We pray for our premiers. We pray for our uh, prime minister. We pray for those that would uh, lead our country, we pray that you would uh, put on their hearts to govern well, to seek justice and righteousness, uh, to love the people that they are governing over, and I pray that you would soften their hearts and show them how to do that well. Uh, we pray that they would turn to you um, in faith and repentance and that you would be uh, glorified at every level of our our country and its um, institutions. Lord, we pray similarly for our world. And again, Lord, we know that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And you can, you every authority is in power under you, subordinate to you, that nothing exists without your, outside of your control. We see war and conflict and oppression and persecution of your people and we pray that those things would stop. We pray that you would uh, put leaders in place that love justice and righteousness and peace and would uh, care for people instead of uh, being greedy for gain and, and using people as commodities. But Lord, we pray that you would... Um, also help your people to grow in faith, contentment and, um, yeah, be able to endure. Uh, we, know, we don't know your ways. We don't know uh, your mind. We know that you are good 
and we know that uh, all things work together for the good of your people. We pray that would be the case and that your saints would be built up, um, your church would grow, your kingdom would come amid, amidst those persecutions and turmoil and conflict. And uh, we, we have faith that you are good and pray that you would strengthen that faith that you are good. Uh, Lord, we pray all these things and we ask that you would forgive us for our sin. Uh, we need your grace and your mercy, Lord, and we pray that you would uh, build up your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We will now sing our song, which I didn't write down, which is This Life I Live. beautiful line uh, we could sing together I will not fear to meet him my life is hidden in him well because of that and because of the gospel you can lift up your heart to receive the blessing of the Lord now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Heavenly Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each and every one of you this day and forevermore Amen <laughs>